Welcome to You But Better Interviews. 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 We interview the most brilliant thinkers and highest achieving badasses on the face of the planet. I have a dream that one day there is an indefinable, mysterious power. Four score and seven years ago, friends, Romans, countrymen, you are the light of the world. It's not just an interview, it's the interview. You, but better. Hello, better yous, and welcome to a special interview edition of You, But Better. We have a fantastic guest for you today, Mr. Mark Dama. Hey. Hey, great to uh, be here, Seth and Lex. I'm very excited to be here on the You But Better podcast, so appreciate the invite. Thank you, Mark Dama. We are ecstatic to be here with you. The energy... Um, we've just been kind of vibing with, and it's it's pretty off the charts. So I'm going to tell people a little bit about your background, and then we are going to dive into it. So friends, here's the deal. We're with Mark Dama right now. Mark Dama is a meditation teacher and an entrepreneur. He helps entrepreneurs increase their energy, focus, and productivity without the burnout. He has worked mm. with Fortune 500 CEOs, astronauts and Olympic astronauts. He is not accepting new clients at this time. Mark Dama founded the 30 day meditation challenge where he leads a live one hour long meditation every single day. Past participants in the challenge include Barack Obama, Volodymyr Zelensky, and the Dalai Lama. Mark Dama's goal is to teach meditation to more people than anyone in history. Mark is our dear friend, and we always have insanely cool and interesting conversations with him. And if you would like to sign up for that meditation challenge, which you definitely want to do, definitely check out markdama.com. That's M A R K D H A M M A.com and follow Mark at Instagram at markdama. Okay, Mark, let's get right into it. You are a meditation teacher. You are insanely good at meditating. I don't think I've actually met anyone who's better at meditating. Um, I once actually asked you if you would just meditate and if I could just watch you meditate to absorb some of the energy. And you were maybe a little weirded out by it. But my real question here is, how did you get these abilities? What is your superhero meditation backstory in a nutshell? Okay, yeah, thanks, Lex. And um yeah, I was a little bit weirded out just the way you, you know, you asked me, but I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to share here. So, I was I came to grad school in 2012 and I started studying uh, positive psychology. So I was here to get a master's degree in positive psychology, and I moved from London to Los Angeles to get this master's degree. And when I was there, there was a lot of studies that we was learning about coming out of psychology, the research on the benefits of meditation. Things like physiological things like, you know, lowered blood pressure, um, lowered feelings of stress, increase in focus, increase in feelings of well-being. All there was just hundreds of studies. And I had friends at university who was meditating, but I had never really done it myself. I'd done two minutes here, five minutes there, and I, I was just dabbling. In meditation. I wasn't actually taking it seriously. So during my summer break, I decided to sign up. I, want, I wanted to dive in and really, you know, see how meditation works for me since there's so much research in about it. So I signed up for a 10-day silent meditation retreat. This was in the desert in California. I got accepted. I had a bit of fear around it, uh, but I just showed up. And at the time, I asked my girlfriend just to drop me off and then drive off without me and not to pick me up unless I was sick or ill. Because I heard a lot of people would drop out. They'd call the girlfriend or they'd jump in the car and just leave because it, it's tough. So um, I got, as soon as we got there, they started doing one hour meditations right out the gate. As soon as we got there, I was like, all right, let's do a one hour meditation. I had probably done a 10 minute meditation before at the most, never one hour. So it was extremely difficult. Um, I hated 
almost every second there until I was on day seven. I was I was just bored. I was thinking about all the work I could be doing, all all the money I could be making, just ev- everything I could be doing rather than at this ten day meditation retreat, just meditating for up to eight hours a day until on day seven. On day seven, I heard my mind just complaining about how boring it was. And I had to have a good conversation with myself, Lex. You know, I had to sit down and say, you know what, Mark? You signed up for this 10-day meditation retreat to be present. So instead of complaining, thinking about what you could be doing, or I wish I hadn't come here, how about you just be present for the last three days? So I did. So I really focused on being present. And the last three days, bizarrely enough, was actually really enjoyable. And on the final meditation of that 10-day meditation, I experienced something incredible. On day one, I could focus on my breath. I could focus my attention for maybe two or three seconds at a time before my mind would start thinking about other things. So in a one-hour meditation, every two or three seconds, my mind was flying off thinking about other things. On that very last day, I sat down in meditation for one hour and I counted how many times my mind lost focus. And I counted two times in the whole hour and each time was only for a split second. When I left that meditation retreat and I got back into regular life, I noticed my my focus felt like an absolute superpower. I could, I was in grad school at the time, had some work to do. I could sit down and completely focus on a project for like six hours until it was done. Absolutely no distractions, doing nothing else, just getting it done. And I just, I could speak with friends and completely focus on them and our conversation 100% without thinking about other things or getting distracted. It literally felt like I had a X men superpower with my focus. And um, it was something incredible. I felt so relaxed, like more relaxed than I was even in my mom's womb, I believe. I just felt so relaxed and so focused that I knew I needed to make this part of my life. Um, So I continued to practice meditation, to build the habit. And then I I started building up to two hours a day of meditation. And now I fluctuate between one hour a day with the the group, 30-day challenge in the morning. And then another, I have a 10 minutes to another one hour in the evenings. I like to do two hours a day. But um, that's really my story about how I got into it. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you for sharing that. The, I had a few takeaways from that immediately, a few of which are, first of all, if you're going to meditate, go into the desert, burn your bridges, break up with your girlfriend, do it no matter what, commit to it, and by the end, your aura will be glowing. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you need to split it with your girlfriend, I, I, you know. I did reconnect with her afterwards, but everything else sounds... Mark, you don't have to take it easy on our listeners. They go through very difficult times for growth, and they're ready for it. They're willing to do it. We ask we ask all better use to be willing to pay the price for greatness. And sometimes that means you go to a place that's painful. And then what do you get? Yeah. You get an improvement that's maybe a thousand percent. You were distracted every three seconds, and then you were only distracted twice in an hour. That is not that is not an everyday improvement, right? And you know, to be fair, I actually, I actually did break up with that girlfriend about a year later or something. So, oh wow, yeah, wow. makes sense. Wow. I definitely saw that part of the story coming. Uh huh. Well, Mark, Mark, I actually had a question uh, about that. Um, do you feel when you came out of that ten day retreat, you said you had a hyper ability to focus? Mm-hmm. What were some of your biggest flaws that you focused on? Some of my biggest flaws. Yes, I mean, Mark, you're a you're a, a gorgeous man. You Thank are you, a, a you have a beautiful, beautiful mind. I mean, when it, here's the thing, folks. If if you haven't been on a phone call with Mark or in person with Mark, it's just like sitting in a room with a, p- a perfectly tuned tuning fork and you are just at perfect peace. Okay. So Mark, what is, what, what is wrong with you? Is there, do you have any flaws? Um, yeah. Thanks Seth. Um, you know, one flaw that I've noticed recently, um, is really around discipline. Mm. 
Discipline. Like you hit yourself a bunch? Do I beat myself up a bunch? Yes. Um, I mean more like, you know, discipline in the terms of di- discipline and integrity. Doing the things that I say I'm going to do mm. on time, um, every time, and being consistent with it. You know, I've actually got a story that you guys might appreciate. Please. Yeah. So we will appreciate it. We'd love to hear it. Okay. Perfect. I'm already grateful for it. Just knowing that the story exists. Perfect. That's enough for me just to know that the story is out there and to know that the story is coming. That's, that's a lot to me. I feel your story coming. Can you, can you send it? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll share that story now. Um, so a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually, you know, I was, I was getting a little bit frustrated in some of the results I was getting in my life. Mm. You know, the relationship with my, my, my wife wasn't doing that great. There were certain things in the business I was dissatisfied with. Um, there were certain things just within myself in my life that I felt weren't working as well as they could be right now. So I started praying. I was praying for help. Like, mm. you know, I need some help here. Give me some guidance. I was I was praying and asking for help from the universe and God, who have, you know, higher power. Mm. And then one, a couple of months ago, we went to see uh, some friends and family in Los Angeles. And I was staying at one of my good friends' house. He has a family, has a wife, he has two boys. And it's um, a beautiful home in Malibu, right by the beach. Oh, wow. The beach in Malibu is I gorgeous. I love Malibu. Seth and I have a lot of uh, very successful friends who live in Malibu. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's just a gorgeous place. It's a place where you can go and be beautiful and, and not be surrounded by... The riffraff, you know, all the... Yeah. You know, you know what we're talking about. Yeah, it's definitely a, be- it's a beautiful place. So, um, yeah, I was there at my friend's house and, um, you know, everybody else... How, was- many, ba- how many bathrooms? Um, I think there was at least probably about four bathrooms. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. In fact, I was told that, um, Jeff Bezos just bought a house, a couple of, a couple of houses down, but I don't know. No if that way. Was true. I've just seen. No it. way. Yeah. The Bays. Yeah. The, the Bezo. Yeah. You know, he's actually come to us for lots of advice. Uh, originally he just wanted to have a bookstore. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. So you, you guys gave him some advice on what to do with that bookstore? Yeah, I said, yeah. I said, Bezo, two words, think bigger. Mm. He did. He did he immediately. Did. And, see, and see what happened? Yeah, I mean, it worked out. It's working out so far for him. Anyway, we um, didn't mean to interrupt. Tell us more about so those sorry. bathrooms. Okay. So you're there. You're there. So yeah, so... I primarily just use two of the bathrooms, but but anyway. Um, That's so, you're so good. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm there, and um, the kids, my kids and my wife gone to bed. His kids, his wife gone to bed. It must be about ten thirty in the evening. And uh, this guy is a he's a he's a director. He's a he's actually a movie director, and also a web three game director. Wow, how yeah. versatile. Hmm. So um, really cool guy. So he, he said, hey, man, I, someone gave me this joint, this joint of cam- cannabis. Mm. You want to sit out on the balcony, listen to the, the waves and, and smoke a little bit with me? So that's not something I do regularly. I live in Utah, so it's pretty much, oh, we don't do it here in Utah. It's not legal. But in, in California, do as the Californians do. So I was like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. So we went on the balcony. We started smoking. And my friend told me that, he was recently in a sweat lodge, like a a native Indian style sweat lodge, which is, of, of Lexa Seth, have you guys ever been in a sweat lodge? Only too many times. I mean, I, I, I feel like if you're not going to a sweat lodge at least once a month, you're not fully getting rid of all of the toxins inside of you. Right. I do have a sweat lodge inside my mind. Hmm. Yeah, I've never been there. Actually, that's the one I've not. It's not something to. that I let just anyone go into. Mark, have you ever been inside of Lex's mind sweat lodge? Uh, sweat lodge? No, I don't. I don't believe I have actually. Hmm. 
Um, Someday, maybe. Someday. Mark, Um, have you been to a sweat lodge? Sorry, what was that, Seth? Have have you been to a sweat lodge yeah, yourself? Yeah, I've, I've done a couple. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just trying to understand the sweat lodge in Lex's mind. But Lex, I, what can you tell us what that feels like, what that looks like, and how did you build it? What I did is I took the idea of I took the idea of burning. Mm. I took the idea of being in a situation that's so intense you sweat all your sweat out. I constructed it in my mind's eye, and then whenever I do anything hard, whenever I work out, whenever I want to Mm -hmm. feel that focus, I go into that sweat lodge in my mind, and I'm able to sweat it out mentally without needing to necessarily sweat it out physically, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That sounds like some advanced NLP, actually, Lex. Yeah, it is. It's definitely, it's it's based on NLP and um, a lot of other acronyms. Yeah, wow, that sounds powerful, actually. Yeah. Anyway, so you were, so you were, so I was at with friends' house. You were, you were in Malibu. You were with, you were with your Web 3.0 yeah. director friend. Yeah. You're smoking some joints. Yeah. So, um, so my friend had done many sweat lodges. So if you're unfamiliar with what a sweat lodge is, it's like in a tent, kind of like a tent, big tent with fire in the middle. And then you have somebody who's like the chief. And my friend does men only ones. So the men sit around in the tent in a circle and then the men share like problems or issues they have in their life. And then the other men like men men problems. Men problems, exactly. Mm. So a man would share his men problems and then the other men would come with advice to help that man. And then they go around to the next man, he would share his problems, and then the, the group of men would would share and um help that man too and it's yeah you get hot it's very uncomfortable um it sounds you sweat it out it sounds lovely like uh but my question is how do you know if the other men are qualified to give you advice well yeah i think it's uh i think it's based on what the group as a whole and then like the law the law of averages i guess most if most of them give you advice then there might be a little bit that you ignore, but then there's some you take from. It's, I guess it's... Yeah, you don't need a formal qualification, though, to be in there. I, I get that. I guess my big worry would be, what if some of them aren't podcast listeners? You know what I'm saying? So I understand the idea that the advice averages out, but if enough of them don't listen to podcasts, you may get be getting... A, there may be a lot of red herrings in that sweat lodge. Yeah. It feels like there would be a lot of ill-advised people. If you're not listening to podcasts, I mean, okay, you're listening to if you're listening to Yuba better, you're 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 fine. I mean, if that's the only thing you're gonna listen to, it's it's enough. But I walk around with an earbud in at all times, listening to podcasts constantly, because I can always be learning. I can always be improving. Well, I think I think the lesson here is just to be aware of this better use, to be aware that not everyone is necessarily listening to this podcast. Most people are. Most people on the on the planet are, but we're not quite at everyone yet. And so that's just something to be aware that's of. That's why we say share it. Like it, subscribe, but share, share, share. Share, 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 share. Yeah, I mean you I guess you guys could put some like you but better sweat lodges. So you you know, just for listeners only. And then you know, you got high quality content and advice coming from those sweat lodges. Oh my. In in the sweat lodges. Those would be better. Those would be sweat lodges, but better. Uh, sweat lodges, but better. Mark, I, <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get away with not Great. paying you for that one. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure out a yeah. way. We'll figure out a way. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure out. We always do. Um, great. So, um, yeah. So, my friend. So, you're in that sweat lodge. Yeah. So he said recently in a sweat lodge he was in, there was a guy who got advice the last time they did it, which I think was like three months ago, like the previous quarter. He got advice from the guy about a problem, from all the guys about the problem he had. This time around, the guy came with the same problems. So what happened was, as the guy was sharing the exact same problems he just shared a quarter ago and got all the advice, the guy's sharing the same ones again. So the chief grabs his stick and bangs. Bangs. Then all the rest of the men get up. They put out the fire. 
they pull down the tent, the sweat lodge, they pull it all down, they move to a different location, put it all up again, get back in the sweat lodge, form another circle, put the fire on again, and then the man who has the same problems came in the sweat lodge, sat down in the new circle. When the man came down and sat in the new circle, the chief hit the stick again, bang, bang, bang. They put off the fire, they pulled down the sweat lodge, they moved the sweat lodge to a different area, set it all up again, set up another fire, created a new circle, and as the man who had that problem, the same problem, tried to come in the new sweat lodge, my friend told him to stop and said, hey, you're not welcome with us anymore. You had the advice last time. You're coming with the same problem. You're not welcome. Go away. As he was saying that, he was just sharing me like his experience and what happened and like how they run the sweat lodges. As he was saying that, it it was as if he was talking directly to my soul because I got the message. The message was, I have everything that I need to get the results that I want. I have all the knowledge. I have all the information. I know all of it. The problem is discipline. I haven't been disciplined. And I knew that. I don't need any more information. I just needed discipline. So that is how I really became aware of one of my flaws recently. Wow. That's incredible. That's amazing. It- so I actually bought a little, um, I bought a little wristband that says discipline equals freedom. So one of the things that that raises for me is with the sweat lodge, it's just that issue of efficiency, right? Like, could you do the same thing, but not have to take that sweat lodge down like three times? Cause that just seems like it's a big inconvenience for everyone. Like you could have just said, Hey, get out and go away. You know? Yeah. I guess you could, I guess you could have just done that. Yeah. Just, you know, just get out of here. Yeah. Get out of here. Go yeah. Away. I'm a big, I'm, we're just going to keep, I'm a big proponent for efficiency. I would agree with that. Maybe as a, as a, if that shaman, or I, I say shaman, I, the leader, uh, if the yeah. leader was a little, I mean, just a little bit better. Maybe if, if they had a little more assert, of an assertive approach. Yeah, you could, you could see like, hey, you don't need to like break down this tent and build it again and keep doing that, which raises a question for me. So this is one of the issues that a lot of people have with meditation and efficiency they want to get that elite level where they can have that more efficiency. So, you know, 10 day meditation retreat, that's a lot. But if you're at that elite level, if you're at that path of mastery, could you take that 10 day meditation retreat and could you compress it into one hour? How efficient can you become in meditation? Um, I don't think you would be able to compress the 10 day into one hour. No. Oh, come on, man. No. Well, what if you I have think, a lot to do, Mark? Come on. You, what if you have a lot to do? Busy day. Yeah. I think there's something about the time, the, the length of time that makes it particularly challenging. Mm. So, you know, any of us can mm. get in a, have a cold shower for five seconds. It's no problem. Oh, yeah. Right. I could do it for 10 seconds if I needed to. There you go. 10 seconds if you needed. But it really takes that. Yeah elite level like Wim Hof who I believe been a um, been on this podcast before who can like go in ice for hours you know it's just it, it takes time uh, to really create the challenge and really uh, forge the steel if you like mm, good metaphor I love a good medieval metaphor I uh, personally am very into Renaissance fairs. Oh, yeah, me too. I don't know why we've never been to one together. That's so crazy. Yeah, I have a I have a personal rule that if I'm in the same state as a Renaissance fair, I go to that Renaissance fair for at least half a day. It's one of my personal rules that's probably served me better than anything. So um, they always have a blacksmith there, and that's one of the reasons why I do relate to that metaphor of forging the sword because it takes heat. Mm-hmm. It takes time. You cannot necessarily, we want to be efficient, but 
can you necessarily rush greatness? That is my question. Exactly, Lex. Here's a different idea, though. Could you front load your meditation so that you do all your meditating for the month in one day and you get it out of the way in advance? Um, yeah, I don't. I haven't tried that. Maybe you can. Um, so like right now on the 30 day meditation challenge, we do an hour a day. So that's 30 hours of meditation in a month. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so what you'd want to do like 15 hours for two days. That would be great. I could do that over a weekend. Yeah. Get that depth in up front and then you're good. You're all set. You've got your mind maybe right. It, maybe it will work. I've not tried it. Maybe, maybe yes. it will. You've spent that time in the forge of your mind. You've, you've confronted that, that fire. You've, you've banged that hammer against that piece of steel on that anvil. You are sharp as a sword, and you are ready to go for those Yeah, Mark, weeks. I mean, you, you described yourself coming out of that 10-day that retreat feeling uh -huh. like you had a superpower. Yeah. Did you feel like you had to keep that, cultivate that superpower, or did you have it? Once you got that out of the way, were you just good to go? I had to cultivate it. Damn it. Um, I, actually, I, actually, I actually had a few weeks that I didn't meditate at all. And I noticed that superpowers just start to wither away. Wow, that's crazy for you because you're the best meditator that we know. And we know a lot of them. Half the people we talk to are in a meditative state when we're in the middle of a conversation with them. So, I mean, that is really impressive to hear from you. Yeah, that was some years ago, Lex. Like 10 years, yeah. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. It wouldn't happen as much. But even you, it withered for it withered. you. You didn't, Yeah. it withered. Did it wither? Now, did it wither slower for you than it would have with, with someone else? Did it wither slower for you than it would have if it had been you from five years before that, <laughs> if you get what I'm saying? You know, the withering changes. Well, I think, it, I think one of the things that happens with, through meditation, this type of meditation, is your brain literally changes. Mm. Yeah. So you, you build more gray matter, your prefrontal cortex, that human part of our brain at the, at the front actually gets bigger. Um, like, if, like physically? Yeah, physically gets bigger. So when you build that part of your brain, then I'm sure it has some lasting effect where you could meditate not as much, but you still have that brain power. Um, so it's going to wither slowly. But at that time of my life, I was still building. I was still building that gray matter. The 10 day meditation was really my introduction to meditation. So it probably, probably withered much faster than it, it would do today after 10 years of it. You know, you can actually see it in some of your younger photos you're because your, your head is a little bit smaller in some of the photos from when you were younger and we did notice that your head has gotten bigger over yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not sure if your skull gets bigger or just, you know. Are you sure? Because whenever my family kind of cut ties with me, they well, said that my head had gotten too big. And I and I, I took it a different way. And now I'm just, I'm kind of forgiving myself for that right now just with the information you've given us today. Sometimes you cannot help that improvement. And I'll offer another point too. When you go to a Renaissance fair, one of the things you'll notice is that a lot of the peasants and the rogues tiny they have heads. very small heads and ti very tiny heads. People in medieval times had very tiny heads because they didn't meditate. And here's the other side of the coin. Have you ever looked at a picture of an extraterrestrial? Yeah. What do you notice about them? Huge head. Huge heads. Very. Have you ever looked at a quarter? A quarter people. has a head on it. George Washington's head has a quarter ever had a thought? No. How it is George? Is it George Washington? How big is that head? It is. Well, on the quarter, yeah. For now, it is. Uh, on the quarter, that that head is so small, and there's no brain in it. And there you go. But if you enlarge that quarter to a half dollar, it would be double the head and double the value. It might have artificial intelligence. When you meditate, your brain changes, yes. I don't think the size of your head actually changes. I think it's just within your current skull. Um, yes, yeah, Seth, I think, I think that's what's going on. Okay, sorry. I, I get a little confused sometimes. Okay, I good mean, to know. I, and I love meditation. Meditation has been such an important part of my life. I've, I've talked to both of you about that at length, maybe much to my chagrin. Um, but I... One time, found myself in a meditative state, a meditative state 
uh, this 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 man put me in a meditative state, and I I basically fell asleep. When I woke up, I was so much faster at typing. I, my typing skills increased by thirty guam. Okay, this is my words per minute. I'm telling you. Okay, <laughs> and and it was powerful. And I I almost went back under just so I could type faster. I can. My thoughts and my fingers were connected. It was, I knew where ASDF was, and I, I struggle with that my whole life. Do, do you mean you was put in a hypnotic state, or a... it was it was a a very like controlled meditative state? And what is the craziest thing that you've ever, once you got someone in a meditative state, you've made them do? So I think you you may be. Um... You may be meaning a hypnotic state, and actually, I do do hypnotherapy too. Do you like, really? Yeah. What is the relationship between those two things? Because I actually remember that when when Seth was in that advanced meditative state, Seth, you were working with it was uh, Doctor Peter Baum. Yeah. Very interesting man. Uh, carried around that um, he had a monocle and he carried around a locket that he would always swing around. And he also played the double bass. The upright double bass. He pl- that man played the bass and the cello, if you can believe that. It was insane. It was insane. Two different two different bodies, but like it was just they just felt like he was a human orchestra. The things that he could do with his mind and his hands. Anyway, Mark, what is the connection between as we're understanding it, meditation and hypnotism mm. are two different things. That's news to us. What is the connection between those things? Could you use them in parallel? Could you hypnotize a meditated person? Or meditate a hypnotized person? <laughs> um, so the hypnotic state and the meditative state are very similar, and it, it might be the same state. I knew it. Wow. Um, we had our suspicions about that. I guess the only way to really know would be to get someone who um, is an advanced meditator. Oh, put, sounds like me. Continue. Yeah. Sounds like everyone on this call. Right. Um, put them in an MRI brain scanner and just see what's going on in the brain. Put some electrodes on. And then get someone in a hip, hypnotic state and see if the similar brain patterns happening there. Um, I'm not sure the technology needed to do that. I'm sure we have it. But if we could look at those two, meditative state versus hypnotic state, then we'd be able to see if they're the same or similar or, or different. So that I guess that's how we would know from, from my experience after being in the meditative state a lot and after being in a hypnotic state a lot, because I actually induce a hypnotic state through self-hypnosis quite often. Um, and actually, the more I do do it, the, the better results I get in life. And sometimes I just forget to do it, which isn't very smart. No, that's amazing. Mark, next time you are in Austin, you have to come by Lex's place. Me- Lex has an MRI machine at his... I don't know if he's, we're allowed to say this, but we have a CAT scan machine. You can say it. You can say it as long as you don't give any details about my exact location. 100%. But you, we can mention the MRI machine. Well, next time you're in town, let's try this out. I, I will go under for both of you guys. Okay. Lex, why do you have a MRI scanner in your place? I do do regular scans, both to study myself and understand myself, and also to screen very early for any diseases okay. I may have. It's like the quantified self stuff. It's kind of like... Checking yourself for lumps, but an advanced version of that. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, f- for a while, um, he was also very particular about his dates, and so he just wanted to see what was going on and if it was, like, worth pursuing. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm talking out of... So I would make them, I would actually make them get an MRI. Okay. Yeah, but he, would, he, wouldn't, he would charge them half price. He would give them the CAT scan. He'd find out what he needed to know, and... You know, well, Mark, you know. <laughs> what what type of stuff would you looking for, Lex? Um, red flags, really. Yeah, mostly flags. Like if they were gonna have a negative mindset towards life, I want to know that 
in advance. Okay. And just kind of the flow of the brain matter, you know, just. Is that something you can see in them? I guess you could see which parts of the brain are hyperactive on an MRI scanner. And if... I can see it because I've studied it and I've learned. He's actually developed a type, Mark. Like he can look at two brains and he could say, "These are this is who I'm going on a date with. Wow. Some people look at faces. I look at hearts, minds, and brains. Yeah. Wow. Scanned brains, only scanned brains. It's not like you. He loves smart people, but it's just it's about the flow of the brain matter. I see exactly. It's fusing. It, I, I like to fuse the intuitive with the scientific. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really what Renaissance fairs are all about: is fu- the fusing of the intuitive with the scientific, because you're taking something from the past and you're giving a, you're saying what can we what can we do now in the present to to mm. recreate that in a in a mic in a microcosm. Yeah, I mean there's so there's so many like experiments we could be doing at all times, right? Uh and I, I think that kind of I mean Mark, I just want to take it back to this. Is there any way that we can meditate at all times while also doing the other stuff that we like to do? Like Yeah. Could I meditate 24/7 while I'm also listening to audiobooks? Yeah. Banging out answers to mm-hmm. text messages answering emails, answering Slack threads. You know, maybe I'm on a date. Maybe I'm, maybe I want to brain scan a few women that I want to go on dates with while I'm at a Renaissance fair, eating a turkey leg, talking to one of the jousters. In a meditative state. Bar- bartering for a new ring that I want to Ooh. buy, and I'm meditating. Looking at a dulcimer to purchase, meditating. Yeah, I think it is possible. Um, one way that we can keep ourselves in a meditative state during waking hours is constantly keeping our awareness on our breath coming in and out through our nostrils. So feeling the sensations of the air coming in and out through our nostrils as we breathe and just keeping a a focus on that while we're doing our day-to-day activities, whether you're in a renaissance fair or at work or whatever, but just constantly bringing your attention back to the breath around the nostrils, then yes, you can keep yourself in a meditative state. And actually, um, when I'm doing a couple of hours of meditation a day regularly, after two or three months, I can keep that level of awareness um, in my dreams too. So yeah, really? it's like I'm meditating while I'm sleeping. Lucid yeah. dreaming yeah. with meditation. You make choices in these dreams? Yeah. I'm I'm usually super aware that it's a dream and I can even do the meditation technique. Um I can even do the meditation technique while I'm I'm doing it. Wow, so you even meditate in your dreams. You can make any choice you want and you decide to meditate. That is powerful. Yeah. Is there a way If there's someone in your life who is not as enlightened as you, can you either, can you transfer that meditation to them? Is altruistic meditation possible? Um, yeah, I don't know if I'd call myself enlightened, but to answer your question, yeah, it is. There's, um, I haven't really studied this, but there are, there are people who speak about it and I, I believe it and I can kind of feel it that through meditation, we can raise our energy of the vibration, our energy, energetic vibration, and other people can feel it. So like you mentioned earlier, um, Seth and Lex, sometimes when I'm really been meditating uh, regularly and have a really good practice, when I enter a room, other people do feel that peace. Mm. And the people like the Dalai Lama and other people with a very high, um, high vibration energy that when they enter a room it you can feel it there is something to shift you do feel more peaceful now sometimes for me there's been times when i'm i'm very high energy and it is very palpable and other times we're not not really but um the theory is that the more people that raise the vibrations through meditation and other things that it actually um, spreads across all of human consciousness and affects all of us and raises a whole human vibration overall. 
I love, I love that image and I love that idea. So if you were in a room that let's say it was neutral, let's say that everyone was kind of average, they don't listen to many podcasts, it's just kind of a zero net energy. And then the Dalai Lama comes in that raises that energy up. Yeah. But then, but, but then Adolf Hitler comes in the room, mm. brings mm-hmm. the energy down. Yeah. But then we turn on an episode of You But Better. Raises the energy up. Is, is our podcast, do you think? I mean, this is just, this is anecdotal. Hmm. Enough to, to overcome the bad vibes of uh, a nasty dictator. Well, I think, I think your podcast is definitely, definitely in the positive direction. Yes. And yes. I think it's definitely raising the vibration yes. overall. Is it enough to, you know, turn over a nasty dictator? Maybe, maybe there was a listener that before they were a listener, their destiny was to become a nasty dictator. But after listening to you, but better being introduced to you guys, Seth and Lex and the content that you share on this podcast, maybe that changed their trajectory and now perhaps we're a meditator like you guys. Wow. Oh my goodness. Amazing. That, a dictator, but better. That's oh, that makes me feel my heart is fluttering. It feels so nice. That's so thank you so much. Mine mine is too. I think what we should do right now is, Mark, you could lead us in a mini, a miniature little meditation right now and we could report our experiences okay. as they yeah happen. totally i because i because to be honest i need to backload my meditation a little bit there's some mistakes i've made in my life that i haven't let go and if i can get some meditation to kind of ra- erase that that would help me yeah can you use meditation to erase the past well what's interesting about the past is it doesn't actually exist so it's already erased Oh, boom! Thank see, God. that was the right answer. I should have seen that one. I actually feel bad asking now it that yeah. I didn't. I didn't see that coming. That was obviously the right answer because mm-hmm. I'm a presentist too. Um, I was just thinking because of the whole Hitler thing. I was like, can you use meditation to erase the past? But then, only the present is real. People. Only that's the only Come thing on. that's real. Uh, you thinking about the future? How about you think about unicorns instead? You fool! Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are there are you know we do. The past doesn't exist, but we do have memories, right? Yeah. And memories can cause suffering. Oh, yeah. If you're a presentist like Lex, you know, if you truly focus on the present moment all the time, so your mind starts thinking about the past, you bring it back to the f- present. Your mind starts thinking about the future, bring it back to the present. If you truly live in the present moment all the time, it's the end of suffering. It's a pathway to enlightenment. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, Eckhart Tolle talks a lot or well, he has books on it The Power of Now is exactly about that I believe uh, you guys have had Eckhart on the podcast I love The Power of Now yeah we do we are, we are Eckhart is a friend of ours I'd really like you to get him on again to be honest um, I really enjoyed that that first episode you did with him I'd, I'd love for you guys to have him back on um, we, we do have a long list of guests that we want to get on the podcast, but we will definitely consider bringing. Eki yeah, it on. was nice. It was maybe one of our quietest episodes, but I did love it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, he talks about being in the present, and I've tested this. What happens if you truly, truly focus on being the present, moment by moment, all the time? So whenever your mind thinks about the future, bring it right back to the present. You start thinking about mm. the past, you bring it right back to the present. And I've found through doing that. You know, sometimes I forget to do it, but when I'm really focused on it, there's no suffering, there's no stress, there's no anxiety, there's no worry, there's no, there's no, no suffering, nothing negative in life, just peace and happiness. No lie, Mark, that, that saved my life. I mean, learning that for me saved my life. Being present? Yeah, just, just learning that suffering is, is something outside of this moment and 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 you can you can live through it. I mean, there's so many things that you're so many adverses adversities we're faced mm-hmm. with and it feels impossible like it's never going to end and it's almost the permanence of pain that is it's an illusion. Right. But learning that I 
experienced that once. I was going to go to a Renaissance fair outside of Longmont. Oh Colorado, my God, Longmont. Love I was, Longmont. It's great. And uh, what happened was that the Renaissance fair was actually closed. It was out of business. It didn't exist. I was planning to get turkey legs that day. I was planning to see oh. jousting. I was going to go to my favorite bazaar, Zavart's Bazaar, to buy some t-shirts, some rings, some things like that. It was closed. And my suffering in that moment was so great. But then what I had to do is I had to bring myself back into the present and say, okay, this is what it is now. This is the reality. What else is there? And I ended up going out for Thai food and I had a great time. Yeah. And didn't, didn't you actually, uh, you actually jousted somebody still in that parking lot, right? I actually set up my own joust in the parking lot of the Thai restaurant. Yeah. The Thai restaurant actually used, uh, uh, like uh, like a neon lighting, not ne- not neon, but um, fluorescent lighting, and some of the tubes were actually out by the dumpster, and so Lex, uh, it's on his Instagram. He's he 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 jousted a fellow he met at the Thai, thai restaurant. And it was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. One of the it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life, honestly. Yeah, that guy is blind now because of the uh, the glass, but you won. So that's kind of nice. He's physically blind, but I don't. I think that's that's different than spiritual. Huge blind. fan though. He loves the podcast. Yeah, big fan. We we took care of we him. We took care of him. Okay. What I think we should do now to finish off is we should end with a short little meditation that we do together. Okay. Then we'll invite we'll invite our listeners to do it with us, and then we will say our All goodbyes. Right. So, Mark, would you be willing to lead us in a short meditation where we can we can share our experiences as they're happening? Sure. How long would you like to do the meditation for, Lex? Let's do. I was gonna say that what we should do is we should do we should take a ten week meditation. We should compress it into four minutes. But I know that's not possible. So why don't we do a four minute meditation? Okay. Would you like me to start a timer? Sure. If that if that speaks right. to you, then let's start a timer. All right. So here's, here's what we're going to do then. We're going to do a very simple meditation. It's not particularly easy, but it's simple. It's called Anapana. Anapana. And all you're going to do, we're going to close our eyes, breathe normally in and out through our nostrils, and put 100% of your focus on the sensations around your nostrils. So the sensations of the air going in through the nostrils, going out through the nostrils. If you don't feel any sensations, you don't feel the air going in and out, that's fine. You can just put all of your attention in that area um, until at some point you will be able to do it. Now, what's likely going to happen is that your mind's going to start thinking about other stuff. As soon as you notice your mind think about anything else, you bring it straight back to focusing on the sensations. Does that make sense? You need any you got any questions, Lex or Seth? That totally makes sense. My one question is I'm wondering if I should get in my MRI machine while I meditate. You could do that. You could you could definitely do that, Lex. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna get in I'm gonna get in real quick. And my question is, am I just focusing hang on the sensations going into my nose? Or in and is out. it okay, in and out. What about on the, the outside of my nose? Like Kind of like on the top of my nose. Yeah, you around your nostrils. Anywhere uh, around in through it. the nostrils, out through the nostrils. Perfect. Okay, I'm in the machine. I'm strapped in. Okay, you ready, Lex? You ready, Seth? Always. Okay, I start the Always time. Ready. So for four minutes. Off we go. So I'll guide you through it. I'm just breathing gently, naturally, in through your nose, and out through your nose. Focusing all your attention on the sensations around your nostrils. As I mentioned, if your mind starts wandering, thinking about anything else, we bring you right back to the sensations around the nostrils.
you're not interested in ideas or thoughts. It's only I the keep, sensation. I keep picturing my nostrils as a person. Yeah, don't do that, Seth. So Just sorry. focus on the sensations. It's asking me for help. I just, it's okay. Just focus on the sensations, Seth. It's not supposed to be easy. Lex, you just focus on your on the sensations too. You have two and a half minutes left. When Lex said something, I pictured his nostrils talking to me and that frightened me. Just focus. Just focus, Seth. <laughs> We're not interested in pictures. Or visualizing, we're just focusing on the sensations around the nostrils. Oh, we're not? Okay, I'll stop looking at the brain scan on the MRI. Please stop yeah. it. Just focus on the sensations. This is a focus meditation. I pictured it. Your brain. I pictured nostrils in a, in a doctor's trench coat okay. so we telling have, me about the MRI. Okay, we have less than two minutes left. So you can just be not speak and focus on the sensations. Then we'll have completed this meditation. The sensation sounds like a, a, a boy band. Shh. All the um, nostrils. Shh. We may need to mute you, Seth, if you continue. I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry. I have to ask which boy band. Just the Temptations. Wanna, the Temptations, got, I guess, are technically a boy band from the Motown era. We've got one minute, 20 seconds left. Remember that our listeners are doing this with us, so. That's right. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, better use. So let's Thank just focus use. on the sensations here and stop talking. One minute left. Mark, I pictured your nostrils saying that to me when you said that. Keep a relaxed focus, Seth. I'm relaxed. Same. 40 seconds. Follow us on Instagram. Sorry. Let's save the talking until we're done. We have 35 seconds left. Perfect. That's it. Last 20 seconds. Last 15 seconds. The nostrils people I picture, they have glasses on. All right. Okay, that's our four minute timer. Wow. So uh, well done, everybody. Wow. Four minutes of meditation. I wow. was so focused during that meditation. It was unbelievable. I am so relaxed. I could not stop thinking about the area in and around my nostrils. And I just felt like it pulled me in. So thank you so much for that, Mark. I felt yeah. like I... I felt as good as if I was holding a turkey leg in my hand. Right? Oh, so good. I was in the zone. Mark, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Folks, sign up for the meditation challenge at markdama.com. M-A-R-K-D-H-A-M-M-A.com. And follow Mark on Instagram at markdama. Mark, anything else you want to plug before? Uh, no, just thank thank you so much for, um, thank you so much for the inf invite, Seth and Lex. Really appreciate it. I'm I'm really happy and grateful to be on the You But Better podcast. It was a transformative experience. We are so grateful for you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. That was a great interview, Lex. I'm so curious. What did your MRI show? Seth, during the entire interview, my frontal gray matter was shaped like a turkey leg. Wow. You, but better. Friends, thank you for listening and becoming a better you. And if you haven't followed us on social media yet, you haven't fully committed. Find those social links in the episode description. Also, please rate and review us on your podcast listening app. It helps more people find this podcast and become totally enlightened. And remember, don't just be you, 
be you, but better.